Denver. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Faculty Fridays. Uh, joining me today is Assistant Professor uh, Ajanae Clemens, um, who is um, uh, based here at the Corbell School as part of the Scribner Institute of Public Policy. Uh, Ajanae Professor Clemens uh, researches the policing of marginalized communities in democratic contexts, particularly in the US and Europe. And she teaches courses on the politics of the policy making process, intersectional inequality, as well as state violence and local security. Um, Professor Clemens earned her PhD in public policy from the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, a place I know well. Um, and prior to that, uh, she worked for the city and county of Denver as a community relations ombudsman while completing her master's degree in public policy at the Corbell School at the University of Denver. Uh, and while there, she helped establish a new government agency, the Office of Independent Monitor, that oversees investigations of police and sheriff misconduct. So she's working on issues and has been working on issues that have in the last couple of years really come to the forefront in our society. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome you to Faculty Friday, Ajane. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here with you, Fritz. So um, maybe let's just start with, with, you know, this is your first year uh, at the, uh, as a professor. And we're coming to the end of the first year. We're almost there. I think we're week eight now. And um, for those of you who don't know, we're on a quarter system here uh, at the University of Denver. So second quarter after the holidays. So it's a long haul. But uh, how's it been? Uh, intense, intense, but great. A lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I need to know. So, any what what are the biggest surprises uh, mm. to you as uh, as a as a new professor? Uh, two surprises. One, uh, I didn't know it was possible possible to be exhausted and energized at the same time. So that's great. Okay. I'm very happy about that. Um, I am you know excited to finally be able to sleep in in a couple of weeks. But um, but at the same time the you know i'm running on a on, adre on adrenaline and uh and the students have been so energetic so i've been able to kind of feed off of their energy so that's been great the second surprise is i feel a little bit like mr miyagi from the karate kid i grew up in the 80s and 90s and uh and so he taught daniel these techniques really they were hidden in these chores of waxing the car and painting the fence and he got frustrated and he complained one day and he said, what is this? You're making me do all your chores around the house. And so he told him to show him the chores. And um, and then they started flat out fighting, uh, sparring. And then he realized that he knew karate all of a sudden. Uh -huh. And so that's the stage that we are now. That's, that's the stage that we are now after learning all these theories. Now they're policy fighting and it's just like the coolest thing to watch. That's great. Well, it's great. It's great, isn't it, to have the students uh, back in person and, and you know, to feel the energy and their energy now. It's really a good thing. Now, you actually grew up in the Denver area. Mm -hmm. You mentioned growing up. Um, and I was curious, sort of, say a bit about sort of what were the influences in your life that led you to an interest in public policy? Wow. Um, you know, they have this kind of made up term that hides public policy in K-12 called social studies. So I actually learned the foundations. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to have great, like amazing teachers, um, seventh through 12th grade in social studies. Um, and so that was my foundation. But um, in college, I when I was an international relations major, there was a state legislator by the name of Wayne Ford, State Representative Wayne Ford, who came to speak to the students. Uh -huh. And uh, he was so charismatic and the issues that he was passionate about so resonated with me. I literally was like, I have to meet this man and pestered him for weeks until he agreed to give me a job. He wasn't even like hiring at the time, but he was impressed with my persistence. So he just made up a job for me working for him at his nonprofit. And then from there, um, after a couple of semesters, he took me with him on the hill the Iowa State Legislature and the assistants were seated right next to the legislators. So you actually got to see laws being made on a daily basis mm. in sitting in the chamber. And that's what really kind of opened my eyes because I had no idea prior to that how much power these folks had to influence your everyday quality of life. So that was um, that and a very 
uh, kind of powerful conversation, I'll say, with with uh, Senator Stephen King, who's since then become a congressman. And uh, and so I went to speak with him because he was trying to pass this bill, uh, the God and Country bill that was going to teach well, teach uh, religion in the schools, teach the Bible, actually, in the public schools and um and roll back their attempts at uh at uh, multiculturalism so i went to speak with him and and i was a senior you know in college and he interrupted me and he said look look kid you know we don't have time for all these subgroups all right the bottom line is that european men founded this country and that's what we need to be teaching in our schools and uh, and so that really kind of switched my focus from international relations to paying attention to what was happening in my own backyard. And that's when I really started to get involved in public policy and decided um, to go back to school for a master of public policy. What did you well, that was a remarkable story. What did you say to him when he said that to you? Oh, I actually um, started to educate him a little bit on the things that he was attributing to Europeans that were not uh, invented and innovated by Europeans. And then he excused himself and said he had a meeting. (laughs) Yes, well, I can imagine. Well, um, that's uh, what a great story. And and, um, um, uh, it's you you, you, roll forward. You came, uh, you you get your undergraduate degree. um, uh, You shifted your focus uh, uh, and then you came uh, to the University of Denver to get a master's in public policy. And you could, uh, but while you, I, was it while you were there, uh, while you were getting the masters that you started working with, with the city, um, with, as, as uh, with the uh, community relations, uh, ombudsperson. Or That's in, correct. In yeah. Um, and, um, and one of the things I think I mentioned in the intro that you were involved with establishing the office of the independent Mo- monitor. So I'm just curious sort of, um, you know, what, how that came about, what, why, why was it a thing that was needed? What impact has it had? Well, um, at the time that it was created, it, it, there was a sort of groundswell from the public demanding uh, increased civilian oversight of uh, police and sheriff in particular, although it also has jurisdiction over fire. And this was on back to back. This is on the heels of back to back shootings of um, people of color in Denver. And so the office was created. Um, there were at the time six full-time staff, three monitors. I focused on community relations. And um, and then there was a management analyst who was a PhD in statistics and um, an office manager. And so our purpose really was to increase transparency, was to increase public trust in law enforcement and, um, and to ensure that the internal affairs investigations that were, you know, these are allegations of misconduct against police and sheriff, um, that those, whether they're generated externally by the community members or even internally by other officers or the chain of command, that those investigations were really handled in a way that was fair, thorough, quality, and timely. And so that was the purpose of our organization. Uh, we were objective and neutral. And so the idea was to create um, sound uh, processes and policies, then that would allow us to um, make sure that, you know, the investigations were thoroughly conducted um, and handled in a way that generated as many facts as possible to be able to come to reasonable um, findings. And then if it was sustained and there needed to be discipline imposed, if that discipline was reasonable and appropriate as well. And so uh, looking back at your experience or maybe just observing how it's worked since then, do you feel like it has accomplished that end? Uh, It's been successful. um, And I think that that's been borne out by the fact that the office has more than doubled since I left Mm -hmm. um, in 2010. And uh, and then, you know, you even see with that leadership um, and their powers have been expanded, which is really saying something, because at the time that it was created, it was constructed in a way that was the most powerful in the country. So they examined the other models of civilian oversight and actually devised a, 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 an agency that had far more powers than what would typically be be there. Um, and so since then, because of you know various things that have happened with, within law enforcement, the office's powers have been expanded in scope. Um, and the, um, the most recent head of that agency has actually been picked up by LA County uh, which is under a consent decree federally um, to head that agency, which is you know three times the size of Denver. So I think uh, you know that could only come about 
as a result of pretty <laughs> constructive leadership and, and results. Well, this seems like um, uh, Sophie, obviously a great experience in, in, your, Sophie, in your career and um, it seems you know, very much connected with the work that you've done since. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, how, say a few words about how that experience, uh, out, you know, outside of academia uh, has shaped the work that you do now, both your research and your teaching. In a lot of ways, I mean, you know, I, well, first of all, I uh, went out in the community and I probably had about 150 meetings talking with all kinds of diverse communities about um, the process. And, uh, and I also talked, I pr personally processed a couple thousand complaints. I ran our police uh, community mediation program. So we had professional mediators who would facilitate the conversation between officers and, and civilians. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I spoke with police officers directly about their complaints. I went to officers meetings. I went to, you know, Christmas parties and uh, barbecues and, you know, I shadowed officers. So I have uh, and I and I saw how they were trained at the academy. So um, so I really kind of was able to build up this knowledge of policies, but also very kind of how those how their experiences as officers and as community members were internalized, right? And mm -hmm. um, and how it influenced some of their decision making or some of their thoughts in in things that are sort of elements of that relationship. Um, and then uh, when I went after the monitor's office to work in DC as policy director for black state legislators across the country, right. these issues were certainly heating up across the country oh, yeah. and they were just back to back. And so um, and so working with legislators to implement policy is something that also um, influenced my research um, in trying to devise uh, studies that could lead to policy recommendations. Um, but also now, you know, as a professor, um, trying to, you know, help students understand the, the benefits of, of, of academic research, of uh, using that to formulate sound public policy recommendations, and uh, sort of some of the, how the politics comes into play with these processes as well. Yeah. Uh, full disclosure to everyone. I, I met uh, Ajene when you when you uh, came to Duke University to be a PhD student, and I was a professor there. And I remember meeting you and being so impressed with. The, I heard some of this then, this background that you came with, which is quite unusual for for a, a, a starting uh, PhD student, and I think probably a bit of a shock, you know, to, to <laughs> <laughs> in the system to sort of. Be, you know, be a starting student after all that really very yes. you know, significant policy experience. Um, but it seemed to me, and, and, and maybe uh, that, that that sort of deep grounding, that deep knowledge um, is, is been incredibly valuable to you um, in terms of, of having a better feel for what questions to ask, how things actually work, those kinds of things. It, 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 I know, uh, it, it, say a bit more, you even, you even said a bit uh, just now about when you're talking to students about the what one can learn from experience or what one learns in the world of practice and what one learns in academia. How do those things go together in your mind? Mm. Well, I think it is important to uh, gather evidence. I mean, first of all, to be even know what evidence is and what it is not, right? <laughs> but um, which is increasingly important. But um, you know, to be able to uh, have some kind of uh, rigorous process for uh, for answering questions, for raising questions and answering them appropriately, and um, and finding out, um, you know, finding out what it's going to take. Uh, to kind of sift through all the noise, right, and um, and come up with something that's grounded in you know facts, in how people actually behave, which is borne out by the empirical research, right, um, and uh, but that also you know equips them with with arguments, um, with um, you know not just sort of the heated emotional rhetoric, but really being precise and kind of technical. Uh, with how they are carrying out um, their recommendations and their writing and their speaking um, and all those things and how people are likely to respond to that and so how to make those arguments then even more robust. So I think you know bringing together the the, the research side and the okay 
you know, being able to walk them through different scenarios, taking them through case studies. When I had to, for example, write a proclamation in the, I had a couple hours to write a proclamation um, for Michael Brown's funeral, you know, before the facts were even in, right? Um, so that was televised. So how, you know, walking them through actual scenarios of what occurs and then helping them to think about, you know, that rational, uh, uh, <laughs> scientific process, yeah. but then also be able, being able to be nimble and respond to the politics that are kind of flying, uh, flying at you at, a, you know, 80 miles per hour. Yeah, it's, um, I, I was, uh, you know, Condoleezza Rice was here uh, mm -hmm. yesterday and today, and we had a, a bit of a conversation about the uh, different worlds of so the political science world that in that world of academia and the world of practice. And uh, I, even, I, I essentially asked her the same question I asked you and, and it was, you just, same thing, the, you know, the, that um, phenomenon that uh, in academia, you have a long time span, uh, a lot of time to sort out the questions, et cetera, but great distance from the events. Uh, whereas in the world of practice, you have, you know, you're, you're under duress, you have limited information, but you're also, you know, you also have in, you have sort of inside information and how you put those two things together, I think is, is uh, fascinating. And it's great, I would think, for your students uh, that uh, you can not only tell them about that, but say, I was there, I had this experience and it's good to have stories to tell, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, well, let's turn to your to, to the to your substance you know, to your research, um, which is really uh, you know on on uh, some of the some of the issues that have been at the forefront in our society uh, in the last few years. Um, of course, they've always been in some sense at the forefront of society. It's it's own perhaps that we've attended to them more in the last few years, but certainly the question of police community relations that you work on have come into sharp relief um, with the killings of so many people. I mean, Eric Garner, you, uh, Michael Brown, who you just mentioned, Freddie Gray, George Floyd in Minneapolis, many others, um, which of course has sparked the national conversation, Black Lives Matter movement, you know, a tremendous amount of attention on this. And, and so I'm, I'm I'm curious because you you were working on these issues, you know, prior to this current to the the current moment, how all that um, attention, the publicity, BLM, how has that affected, just big you know big picture in your mind, how has that affected police community relations, the field you're working on, mm -hmm. uh, how's all that attention really, you know, what impact has that had? Mm -hmm. That's such an interesting question. Um, I'm not sure that the goal was to impact or improve the relationship per se, and it probably hasn't yeah. improved it. It probably, you know, hasn't eased tensions or improved that relationship in any way. I think probably the goal was to impact outcomes or performance. Fair and yeah. there has been a there's been a, uh, a handful of studies. You know, you would think that there would have been a little bit more. Um, academic uh, attempts to to look at the impact of BLM on um, on police sort of outcomes or that relationship, but there there haven't been that many. Um, Rod McCollum is a science journalist and he literally just released an article in Undark within the last couple of days and talked about <clears throat> three studies that have been done since 2018. Mm -hmm. You know, one um, by, I wanna say Williamson, Trump and Einstein um, talked about how how th there were more likely to be BLM protests um, in areas that had had that had seen a police killing, and and mm -hmm. they estimated that as many as sixty percent of cities um, that had had at least one police killing saw some sort of protests. I mean, of course, this happens in rural areas as well, although sometimes the protests or demonstrations haven't been quite as robust. Um, there is another study. Um, led by L that looked at uh, sort of five years worth of, of police officer involved killings and saw a slight decline in the number of whites who were killed by police. It was small, but statistically significant. Um, so there's a sort of ironic piece in which the Black Lives Matter movement has actually saved additional white lives. 
Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, you see unarmed. This is this is the researchers that you've seen unarmed whites, um, you know, still much less likely to be killed than unarmed um, black and Latino um, folks. Uh, and then there was this third uh, study that just came out in 2021, although it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. This is sort of converted from Travis Campbell's um, dissertation, but mm -hmm. he's a brand new professor of economics now at, um, at Southern Oregon University. And, um, and so he uh, actually found in this difference in difference uh, examination that uh, for every five protests out of maybe 1,624, there was a one less person who was killed. Um, and that even though, you know, when you look nationally, uh, there hasn't necessarily been a significant change or drop in the persons killed that in the places where these protests have been, uh, have been larger, have been more, you know, sustained, um, that those have actually seen the sharpest decrease in officer involved killings. So that when you total it up, it looks like something like 300 additional lives who have potentially been saved by this. So, you know, th there's, there's some evidence starting to emerge, but there does need to be more research on this front. Yeah, so so maybe uh, and, and maybe we just don't know the answers to some of these questions, but I'm so curious about um, so that you're talking about the correlation between protests and some sort of outcomes and in mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. uh, officer involved killings. Um, is there evidence of of changes in police behaviors um, uh, that we've seen at all? It, that has in, have we been able to? Uh, I know there are all kinds of, of, of reactions, responses, but in communities, for example, where where there were protests and then there were new mm. policies, do we see changes in policing in the ways in which police do their jobs? I think um, that is also forthcoming in a sort of systematized way, being able to notice that. Um, but certainly, certainly there have been um, changes at the local level, um, you know, with various departments, um, there are over 18,000 law enforcement agencies in the United States. Right. And so it's just becomes very, very difficult to um, understand, you know, the full scope of what's happening. But, you know, they're in the wake of uh, Ferguson and, and then particularly Baltimore literally erupting. Um, there were police chiefs who were gathering at these conferences and saying, like, we don't want to be ferguson like right. actually turned into a verb. Oh. Um, and so there were some movements then, um, 2015, 2016, 2017, to try to ease those relations, um, to try to put some kind of measures in place, to listen more to communities and see what they wanted. Um, now, have those been sustained? What have those outcomes been? I think that's something that uh, is very much an open question. Interesting. So, so again, as a very much as a outsider or lay person in this whole field, you know, what the the advent of body cams, dash cams, you know, the prevalence indeed of cell phones and and and, the, and um, has shined a light on police behavior. We have evidence now, the video evidence of things that we would never that were happening before, but we never would have seen before. Um, I suppose George Floyd being the most, you know, dramatic case of that. Mm -hmm. Is there, is, is there, what, what is the thinking about what impact that has on the way police behave, if any, mm -hmm. uh, the notion, the idea that they will be recorded and, 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 and what they, how they act might be seen ultimately has, do we know anything about what impact that's, that's had? Um, you know, University of Chicago Crime Lab uh, has done some study on this and noted that uh, body cam footage or body cam usage has more, doubled since 2014. Um, they've estimated a decline in something like like 10 percent uh, in use of force cases, 17 percent in complaints, which, you know, is good, certainly. Um, but at the same time, you know, as this program is scaled up, uh, it's also, you know, has the potential to be less effective in the differences in how people implement it. So, um, you know, the body cam uh, usage is not a panacea. 
Um, it's not something that's, you know, in and of itself can automatically lead to improved behaviors um, that has to be accompanied by good policies. It has to be accompanied by uh, good policies around storage and around auditing, around, ex you know, looking at what's happening and then having a reasonable um, accountability measures uh, to follow up, you know, if officers are violating those those policies and practices. So if you don't have a strong kind of disciplinary process in place, then um, then the, the 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 potential for the body cam footage is really hampered, um, and then you're stuck with this sort of you know what happens and what pops up in the media is is you know these one offs um, yep. versus a more systematic uh, usage of of the body cam footage. Yeah. yeah. I suppose it's the nature of the media that one only sees the sort of dramatic, you know, um, mm -hmm. things. And but when I see them, I'm always amazed. Like, like, don't they know they're on camera? Like, <laughs> this, this is sort of interesting that. And I suppose if you're an officer, you, you, you don't think I'm doing something wrong at, while you're doing it. Um, um, at least uh, because it's often shocking in a way to see mm -hmm. the behaviors that are captured. You think. Don't they know? <laughs> well, and that's and and that goes to the point is is that sometimes people forget they just like literally within you know fifteen minutes of recording. I mean that's Doctor Phil too, right? When he puts a, whole, a camera in people's houses, you're like, no. um, <laughs> but but yeah, I mean people do forget that they're on camera. Um, but also, you know, if you don't have those those follow up processes in place and they know that there's not very much you know accountability then they're really not paying attention to how they look on camera and then um and yeah and then sometimes there are poor policies and poor training that is embedded in the culture of the department so relative to how they see things done on a daily basis they may not feel wrong at all and it may take that outside perspective to be like really we still do this or you know this is done so sometimes it requires that outside perspective to even check what's happening internally interesting now you mentioned uh, um, that you even observe training as part of your uh, mm -hmm. job um and and uh uh so question about police training i mean it, it's it's um it's been said that that often the training is um it emphasizes a lot on defending yourself as a police officer that the being wary at all times and of course it's let's learn to be honest it's a dangerous job and there's reason to do that so uh, um but i'm curious what your take is on i don't know if you can generalize on on the way in which police officers are trained and 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 the extent to which um the that training leads people to be uh, police officers to be more fearful than they need to be to use mm -hmm. force more quickly than one might like etc mm -hmm. yeah training uh, it makes a big difference and you know again with eighteen thousand different agencies the training is literally all over the map uh, excuse the pun mm -hmm. um and absolutely there's a video that's shown of an officer doing some routine, you know, traffic stop who's all of a sudden killed by the driver and, you know, a message that, okay, officers who are out of shape and too nice um, are more likely to be killed, you know, or things like that. Um, so from the beginning, having them more on guard than they need to be um, or in a mode of, you know, being more quick to use force or to use lethal force even than than needs to be the case. Um, it makes a difference to train officers on communication, on on all kinds of communication techniques, on de-escalating, on calming themselves down, mm -hmm. on taking on taking a step back and interrupting some of those unconscious biases um, that they may have, uh, particularly in terms of masculinity threat and things like that, that they're interrupting that uh, that they're slowing their their brains down, that they're slowing their bodies down, that they're taking those breaths, and then that they're more considering, uh, you know, the the facts, uh, more objectively considering what mm -hmm. what threats are reasonable and what are not necessarily threats, um, and then uh, once they kind of get a hold of themselves, then perhaps de-escalating other folks. So those are important things that can be uh, helped in training. Also. Uh, 
there's a sort of crisis intervention um, training that can occur that mm. helps explain to officers about um, people in crisis and uh, disabilities, mental illness, um, you know, all these kinds of scenarios where people might not be thinking rationally or whether they may be under the influence and so where they might need extra, you're still being tactical, you know, you're still observing those tactical practices, but at the same time, uh, just being more human, uh, calming other people down and bringing uh, the situation to a safe resolution. That's very interesting. Are you seeing trends? Um, again, you know, many, many, many police forces, but I'm just curious if this is that kind of training is more prevalent now or there uh, than, than it was than it once was. Uh, it has grown, um, you know, again, with scaling up because there's that that dissemination that happens at police conferences. And so they're learning from other departments that have done things and, and trying to implement. Um, but at the same time, you know, when things get scaled up, sometimes they kind of lose that um, efficacy. So, you know, it's something that ha that needs to be updated. Um, one of the things that's been learned, which is is, is interesting, even in Denver, um, after Paul Childs was killed in in 2003, um, this was a 15 year old African American uh, boy who had some uh, learning disabilities and. Uh, mental health issues and did not observe, did not listen to the officer's order um, to drop his weapon and then was killed in front of his family, um, struck with nine bullets. And so this was part of the impetus for the creation of the Office of the Independent Monitor. And in the wake of that, uh, Mayor Hickenlooper at the time implemented this like automatic, you know, training up of all police officers. And what they found is that because Denver's um, training is like six months, adding another week of training didn't have the sort of weight that they thought it would. And so they implemented it, but then after officers had a good, you know, seven, eight months, nine months, a year on the job and had some kind of frame of reference, it was more effective to then go back and do a much oh, deeper training later on. And so I think that's something that um, is very beneficial for departments is to be able to, um, is to invest in that, um, in the, uh, excuse me, the ongoing education and, um, and then also making sure that the officers when they get out the field training officers and those sergeants in particular um, as the first line in that supervisory role uh, are reinforcing the new practices that are learned in training because you can have these like wonderful uh you know modules that come through the academy and then they're being systematically undermined and dismantled as soon as people get out so you really have to have these other ways to reinforce that behavior, whether it's through commendations, um, whether it's through, you know, uh, promotion and aligning your hiring, your, you know, policies, your training, your promotion, your commendations, aligning all of that uh, across the department so that the department is is consistent philosophically. Yeah. Um, we'll come back to the policy, some of these policy uh, questions, because uh, um, uh, at the end of the day, you're a policy person and we, <laughs> and we, and we want to know what to do. And, you, and, and already you, 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 that's been really interesting insights into, into what is useful in the, in the training process and how they integrate with the other components. I did want to ask you though, um, about your comparative work because you study mm -hmm. uh, police community relations um, in the US, of course, um, and these issues that we've been discussing, but you've also um, been studying them in other contexts, in, 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 in England, in, in France, and elsewhere uh, in, uh, in Europe, um, uh, where there, again, there are uh, minority groups, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, often the form of the problem is, or the issue is about relationship between the, uh, police and, and a, a minority group, and I'm just curious. so a couple of questions. So you know, you know, why comparative? What what do you learn uh, by looking comparatively uh, um, that you don't learn if you only looked at the United States? Mm. Wow, um, I was actually surprised at how much they had in common because there are these stark differences like for example the uh chances of um americans being killed by civilians and by officers is just far 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 greater mm -hmm. um but at the same time um there were some similar concerns around 
um, around uh, around you know being humiliated or around uh, being there was there was some concerns for for officers um, you know to make sure that they were well equipped um, to make sure that they were able to protect the community from mm. offenders um, and so there were just some things that. Um, yeah, I would not have necessarily expected on either side separately, um, you know, that I learned by doing them together. Interesting. Uh, and what you, you pointed to the similarities. What, what would be some, because the contexts are different, say we pick one of the countries. So what, uh, mm -hmm. you, you, mm -hmm. you study, I know you're, you're, you did work in England, for example, mm -hmm. I know yes. pretty well. Um, very different context than in right. terms of um, the level of armaments, <laughs> um, both the police and the, and the civilians. Um, um, you pointed to some of the similarities. What are, what are some of the the ways in which the there are differences, differences in context that um, are, are are there? I mean, are, are, is the overriding story really this? This is really pretty parallel. And no, I mean there were a couple of differences. One is that um, because. The London Police, the Metropolitan Police Department, actually has such a reputation for being polite. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so then when they weren't, so the, people were far more angry about it and felt, you know, pretty incensed because um, there was just like this expectation. Um, but also, the, the austerity measures that had been put in place some years ago that slashed the police department in half uh, mm -hmm. then led to um, some concerns around not having enough police that was i mean in the u.s you know and in durham where i interviewed these young men uh there were some complaints about the way in which officers were distributed or how they prioritized their time or you know their presence or things like that how they responded their response time but um, but it was very stark in London because literally when I went past what I thought were, you know, they were police stations, those police stations were empty. Uh, they were literally empty mm -hmm. um, and, you know, having cobwebs in them because the, the force had been slashed. And so with knife crime on the rise and gun crime on the rise uh, there, particularly among young people, there were a lot of uh, most of the young men were actually quite concerned about um, the extent to which the police not only could protect them from or younger people if they felt like they themselves had kind of aged out of that risk mm -hmm. could, could could protect younger people um, from what was happening in these trends, but also with some of the uh, increased uh, gun trafficking and, and gang expansion in London, uh, where it's like more dangerous than New York, for example, uh, to their shock. Uh, they were concerned about officers being outmaneuvered, outgunned, outmanned. And so um, so those were the more top of mind concerns that weren't necessarily there on the American side. That's very interesting. Um, now, I want uh, to remind uh, everyone listening, uh, love to take your questions as well. So as well. So if you would, if uh, you have a question, put it in the Q&A. Um, please, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, a lot of directions we could go, but but I'm I'm want to come back to sort of the the the, the policy side, and maybe we we're talking about uh, uh, you're talking about funding, and so uh, there's big you you reflected a, a big cut in funding in 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 London and in, mm -hmm. uh, that was across mm -hmm. England or just in London, mm -hmm. um, as you well know, uh, it was a push here to, uh, amongst many to quote, defund uh, the police um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, advocating, I'm not sure the phrase was, you know, uh, particularly apt, but it, you know, basically advocating, uh, reducing resources to at least to tr traditional policing. And I'm curious a couple of things, you know, one, so you, 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 where you come down on that, you know, what's your sense of that? Because as we're talking, I hear you talking more about we need to invest in training or we need to invest in other other things so that's that, i guess that's the first question and then i'm curious because you've had a lot of relationships and, and conversations and engagement with police 
Hmm. And so I'm curious the extent to which, um, in your experience, police departments, police officers have have felt a bit beleaguered um, in this moment. So those are two very different questions. You can take either one first. Hmm. Um, so I'll take the last one first, um, because it also ties into an earlier comment or question that you'd had around uh, the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement on police behavior. Okay. And certainly there have been some, uh, at least anecdotally and in the news, there have been uh, certain departments that have, where we've seen a drop in enforcement or a slower response times or things like that um, as they've been impacted by low morale or you know they've expressed the kind of flexed uh their ability to serve those communities and their decision to serve those communities so that has that has been reported um uh the earlier part remind me of the earlier part of your question well it was really a sort of a conversation really around policy but but it's really around your sense of and we could we should, we should really sort of get into the whole question about police reform and the things that you think are, are yes. you know yes. need to be done because yeah. you know one school of thought was was let's let's starve the police if they're not doing you know this is right. this is the problem this is the best way to attack that you know to approach mm -hmm. this you may well agree with that I don't know but but uh, I'm curious sort of where you are and in, in on mm -hmm. that issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I, so I did these, I conducted these in-depth interviews. These were about two hour interviews, each of these young men, black men in Durham, North Carolina, who lived in the most economically distressed areas. And this was prior to the pandemic. And even though I was aware of the defunding the police movement, I specifically did not ask that question because it wasn't well known yet uh, in 2019. And so um, I was really trying to understand from them organically you know, what um, they wanted to see, what what it would take for them to feel safe, mm -hmm. uh, for them to be safe in their own words. And so I tried not to kind of uh, move the conversation in particular directions, but to be as open-ended as possible in that regard. Um, some of the things that they wanted to see though in police were, uh, were a sort of a, a different composition of, of the force, um, but also they wanted more training. They wanted more, um, they wanted they wanted them to be more invested in the community. They wanted them to be more connected to the community. Mm. Um, and, in, and in some ways, and this was, this was a surprising finding for me, they wanted in some ways for them to be more embedded. And so, uh, you know, it would be interesting to go back and see, you know, now that this defunding the police movement has um, come to the fore, if any of them would have changed their perspective since then. But um, just based on the kinds of talents and skill sets that they expected or that they wanted to see in police officers, um, some of them even suggested that because of the difficulty of the job and what was required and what they would want officers to do that in some ways they should be paid more um so it's actually kind of hard to square their dream for law enforcement with uh the sort of zeroing out of the budget i think um and and, and that's not to say that that there are flaws or that you know it's an inherently wrong any, anything like that i don't take issue with any of that i'm just saying that when i went to this area where where 57 percent of them had witnessed firsthand a stabbing shooting or murder mm. where three quarters of them had been a victim at some point of a violent crime that what they felt it would take to have protection that they believe they deserved as Americans, as American citizens, that they believe their white counterparts enjoy on a daily basis, that uh, what they wanted to see in order for that to happen was demonstration that officers cared about them. And how do they demonstrate that? They roll up their sleeves, they change flat tires, they get in there and they get in those community centers and they are, you know, throwing block parties and they are 
uh, you know, preparing food for folks in need. And they are literally, they are checking on people. They are checking on families to see how folks are progressing. Um, how's that job going? How's that school going? They're watching kids grow up and they're slam dunking and they're cheering them on uh, that they're able to, you know, have productive lives. Um, the, the level of, actually the level of desire Ooh. for officers to be a part of the community was powerful and it was across the virtually the entire pool. Now, that's not to say that um, folks hadn't been hurt and that they um, sometimes didn't try to avoid them. Uh, you saw avoidance behaviors in, in their comments, um, you know, in, in, in those things and fear uh, and anxiety when they were uh, interacting with police. But at the same time, when given the opportunity to spell out a dream, that dream was for officers who were some combination of Boy Scout and FBI agent mm -hmm. and ninja, right? <laughs> that those officers were <laughs> dis discerning that they had, they, they exercised superior judgment, that they were just, that they were honest, that they were earnest, that they, um, that they were people persons, right? That they wanted to make the communities better that they served in. those you interviewed uh that's that's truly really remarkable i'm sort of curious whether you know whether there are places where that vision is is taking hold in any way uh whether there whether we see that or there's any movement in that direction i certainly would love to make that part of my next projects uh <laughs> so oh. um but i mean i'm also hesitant to kind of uh, say, oh yeah, these this this department is doing great on all these fronts because then it's like as soon as you say something like that, you know, there are these things that come out. But at the same time, I do think it's important um, to recognize when important efforts and improvements are being made, and that there is this that I mean, that's where academics can bring value, can add value, is to go in and say, okay, on these metrics, you know, these departments have seen improvement, and how can other departments learn from that? And that's something that. Um, you know, that that is part of my future work. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to that work. Let me um, let me take some. Uh, we have some questions in the in the chat, uh, in the Q&A. So let me let me take um, uh, ask some of those. So um, Charles Fleming asks, uh, what elements should be included in a federal bill to overall policing across the country to create a universal standard? Oh, wow. Well, there are some <laughs> there are a few things i mean that's just that's we could have like a whole hour on that <laughs> question. that's a great question yeah quickly um, <laughs> answer that <laughs> i mean there are a few basic things uh first of all we don't even currently track when officers take life in this country right we don't i mean there are some efforts to track it but it is not enforce it's it's voluntary as to whether departments enter that inter information into the federal systems so the media is doing a better job of tracking officer involved killings than the federal government is either the fbi the department of justice or frankly the cdc uh so that's something that needs to be enforced um i think at a, at a very basic level right um then just getting a better handle on on racial profiling and what that means because the definition of it has just become so convoluted um essentially uh departments have interpreted racial profiling as the only factor you know race being the only factor um for stopping someone or suspecting them and usually that's that's not the case, right? So you're sort of defining it out of existence. Um, and so there needs to be a more realistic uh, definition and understanding and training and uh, around um, what racial profiling actually is and how it functions. Um, and then there needs to be some uh, standards around lethal force. Um, you know, the courts have been very there have been these moments where uh, they've they've sort of sided with um, with civilians, but 
but the arc of of the courts has been really deferential, quite deferential toward toward law enforcement. And um, and so, you know, they're really reluctant to second guess them and to, you know, this Monday morning quarterbacking. But at the same time, um, they are the most powerful folks in society. They're more powerful than Congress or than the president of the United States and their ability to affect your specific life mm-hmm. and take your specific life. Mm-hmm. And so um, so there does need to be a lot more. Um, I think a building of a framework that 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 honors life, that preserves life, and that tries to get off, get, get officers as many tools as possible to preserve life um, versus, um, you know, really being reluctant to uh, second guess when they take life and, um, and you know, dis, dis, deciding kind of, you know, is the, was it reasonable? Was it reasonable to shoot someone in the back who was fleeing from an, uh, on a misdemeanor? Um, the United States is, you know, an incredible outlier <laughs> in terms of the uh, d- the the standards, the human rights standards that are sort of part of that apparatus of decision making around lethal force. And so, bringing those more in line with, you know, Amnesty International and sort of international standards would be a, a good a good start. Um, so, you know, there are some additional things, but um, I'm, I'm happy to kind of take a couple more questions. Before yeah, we... Well, that was a good start. Um, um, Guy Paget asks, uh, what, what best practices do you see in police departments that have been able to improve relationships with minority or underrepresented, underrepresented communities? Mm-hmm. Yes, I mean, I think one of the... <clears throat> problems that happens with community relations <clears throat> is that uh, you have very select officers who are great uh, relationship builders and out there and kind of the face who are building relationships um, in community meetings with, uh, you know, folks who are who are retired, who are, you know, business leaders, who are uh, excuse me, who are, um, you know, having these conversations over, over over donuts and orange juice. And, and so they're listening to them. And, uh, and so they're not, you know, that's the easy part, (laughs) right? Mm -hmm. And then claiming that that's community relations, uh, you know, (laughs) so, so, um, so just really having a lot more, um, intentionality and forcefulness in having a much wider swath of that community, which can be a long road and it can be frustrating and you can deal with people yelling at you and things like that, but being willing to have a lot more, um, uh, uh, you know, assertiveness in setting up various meetings, targeting various uh, demographic groups and then really listening and finding ways to filter that back into uh, the department and then take action on that. Um, also, also uh, departments that that have that have increased their accountability. You know, in Buffalo, we saw we saw uh, in response to uh, the manager at the tops um, at the tops grocery store uh, being hung up on by a nine one one agent. Um, they scoured that, you know, those, those audio tapes, and they found that conversation, they took swift action, they denounced the action, that person still has due process, they're going to have a, a a hearing coming up, but they're recommending termination for that, for that employee. I mean, officers have far more rights than civilian, you know, 911 agents. But the point is that departments that do implement um, more transparency, swifter measures, um, you know, they still conduct investigations, but that are willing to apologize to the community um, and not and are not fir- first and foremost concerned about getting sued, but are first and foremost concerned about mm. uh, holding themselves and being held to the highest possible standard that those departments that take that very seriously and that see that as honor and oath and that preserve that, you know, those are the, par- the departments that have that are that are making progress. Oh, so so interesting. They um, we'll take a couple more questions here in the, the limited time we have. Uh, Lauren Wilkerson Wilkerson 
ask if you could change one policy in policing, what would you change? What policy would you strive to implement on police behavior? You get one policy. One policy uh, would be a universal declaration that pointing your weapon at someone is a use of force. A lot of departments don't even consider that a use of force. And so, you know, there, you, there is an opportunity, first of all, to declare it a use of force and then to require that use of forces, uses of force are documented and that they mm -hmm. are uh, followed up on not only within that officer's chain of command, but there's someone independent of that um, auditing these kinds of things um, within the departments and looking to see, you know, did that officer need to do that, um, point their gun, even touch their gun, uh, you know, did they need to do that? Um, were there other options available to them? Uh, intervening on the training side and on coaching side and getting them to use other kinds of tools in that situation. Mm -hmm. And then if it was a violation, if, if it wasn't a violation of policy because the policy is not clear, it's tightening those policies, improving the training. Um, but then if they did violate that policy, having some accountability for that. Uh, you, I mean, at the end of the day, you can have the best policies on paper you want, but if you're not, if you're not holding anybody to account, they don't matter. They're not. They, you might, there's not a policy at all, frankly. Um, so uh, those are the things that need to happen, both in terms of the disciplinary process and outside of that disciplinary process, with identifying early in a sort of early interventionist way. You know, what are those behaviors that are problematic that can be corrected, and putting officers on plans and making sure that they. Um, that they, you know, understand the full range of tools available to them in situations and that they're and that they're really using uh, lethal force the way it needs to be used, which is as a very, very last resort. Kathy Yates asks, uh, how do you see the Denver Star program and the co-responder program between Denver Human Services Office of Behavioral Health Strategy the Denver Police Department and Wellpower changing the definition of policing in Denver. So the STAR program uh, is great and it's very exciting. And I know that there are other, um, I mean, they've learned uh, from other departments, but there are also other departments uh, are learning from them. And this is, you know, where you have uh, civilians who are trained in as social service workers, as, uh, you know, folks who are experts uh, in in mental illness and in other kinds of you know uh, these these uh, communications breakdowns or these um, you know lo lower level it's not it's not something that necessarily requires uh, officers to respond but just out of habit we're often calling nine one one because we don't know who else to call to kind of stop this dispute and intervene and so they've done a great job of Denver has done a great job with the STAR program of identifying these uh, kinds of cases in which, you know, people who are experts in this field can resolve this, uh, you know, if, if there's mental health issues that need to be followed up on, that they're getting folks plugged into these services um, so that there's um, also, you know, uh, people getting the help that they need um, and that you're seeing a, a reduction in those kinds of incidents and, and repeat behaviors by those individuals. So um, it's it's something that it is has seen some great results uh, that other departments hopefully learn from and that continues to be invested in and improved upon and hopefully, uh, you know, even within Colorado spreading disseminating that across the state. Well, it's, um, it's great. I know you'll be doing some work in, in, in Denver in, the, um, in, uh, in, in upcoming. Uh, so let's take one uh, last question, um, which is really uh, from Trudy Gaiji. I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing your name. I apologize. Uh, um, but uh, who asked, what is the area of Dr. Clemens research now as she continues uh, the research she referenced that included interviewing men in North Carolina? So say, say a bit about your, your research agenda now. Okay, well, I have a lot more uh, papers and potentially a comparative book to write uh, with these uh, with these interviews that I that I this is thousands of pages of transcripts, so I have a lot uh, to do there. Um, in the future, I'd like to uh, I'd like to do in depth interviews of women um, and do some comparative work there, understanding their experiences and what they need. 
Uh, and, um, you know, white folks, Latinas, African Americans, um, Native American folks uh, in Colorado, uh, but also then um, in rural areas moving forward. And, um, uh, and so looking at those differences between urban and rural. And then, uh, and then I'll continue hopefully to be able to tie back into some international work. I have a lot of things to do domestically first. Um, and then starting to get into, uh, as we talked a little bit earlier uh, about uh, impact evaluations and looking at um, the particular efforts of departments and seeing you know, what those effects have been so that those uh, results can be hopefully shared, uh, disseminated and, and scaled up even. Well, I look forward to to seeing all of that. This has been uh, so interesting, such a rich, uh, informed discussion. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, uh, it, it really is a testament to your ability to navigate between the, your own experience in the world of practice, but your then attention to the voices of those you interview uh, uh, in Durham and elsewhere in London. Um, and so um, thank you so much. Uh, for for being with us today, to, for sharing all of that, uh, and I know I, I speak for everyone listening. Uh, we have so many questions we didn't get to. My apologies <laughs> to, to to those who, that we didn't uh, get to answer. But uh, thank you so much, and thank you all of all of you for being with us today. Thank you, Dean Mayor, and thank you everybody for being here. I really appreciate it, and it was an honor. Bye, everyone.